So what you were saying from your study on the cancer cells, sequencing the cancer cells, you were finding these things, these these plasmids in the cancer cells, how much later? This was how, like- A four, year. A year later. Yeah, this person was Forex vaccinated and- uh, a Four year, times, uh, wow. A year later, so- the, And then what does that mean? Does that, what does that mean for them? The fact that it's still in these cells, were these cells there prior or were these cells created? And then what does this mean for people that aren't vaccinated that are in proximity to these people? Uh, all right, that's that's a, a couple points there. So, um, so this patient's deceased, unfortunately. They 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 have the, the they a year after vaccination, um, they got their first biopsy. Uh, a week after that, they got another biopsy, and then in four weeks they were dead. Whoa! Uh, and we, they got a they got a post mortem biopsy as well. We sequenced the post mortem in the first the, the first one, um, and we're looking at the differences between those two. Mm -hmm. Um, there is there is a plasma in there that codes for spike. It's the sequence of that spike is a little different. It's actually, it's a lot different than than the spike that Pfizer has in the vaccines we've sequenced previously. Um, so this this has raised a question as to what is the really the source of this plasma because there, the differences there have raised alarm bells. Like it's not exactly what we we saw in. Now we've only sequenced like two other lots before. So we don't have good we don't have good surveys surveillance of all the different lots for Pfizer. They, they could have different plasmids in each one. They could all mm -hmm. be the same. We don't know. We, we need to do more um, to sort that out. But there is another hypothesis that could be at play here that leads to um, a much more frightening scenario, I think, in my mind, uh, which is um, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, there's, there's a paper that was published that really went unnoticed. Um, it was a group in Seattle that showed that their lab people were testing positive for COVID but didn't have COVID. And they only tested positive. If you remember the COVID test, they actually had three assays usually testing for the virus. They would look at the spike, they'd look at nucleocapsin, and they look at the envelope region. So, and if all three lit up, they were pretty confident the virus was there. Occasionally, one of them would drop out, like the S target would drop out once in a while. They had that happen in Europe. It was called S target failure. Um, and they would say, all right, we don't really know if you've got COVID because only two out of the three assays are working. So what was happening in Seattle in this lab is only the nucleocapsid test was going off. And that was really weird. And it was, it was in all their lab staff. Um, and it turned out that same lab was working on a vaccine that was had nucleocapsid cloned into something very similar to Pfizer's vac uh, plasmid there. So that somehow infected all the lab people. And then it got out of the lab and infected their housemates. Uh, and so they the paper hypothesized that, okay, this must be because this is a shuttle vector that can grow in E. coli and can grow in mammalian cells. That means it's transmissible. Our vaccine in the lab infected our staff and got out into the wild. Um, this was another lab leak that didn't hit the radar anywhere. And um, they kind of wrote it off as, no worries, it's nucleocapsid, it's not spike. You know, if it were spike, you know, maybe we could have gotten those people some spikopathy because um, the spike protein itself is really pro-inflammatory. Nucleocapsid, perhaps not as much. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of wrote the paper as, hey, watch out, your PCR tests might be giving you false positives if you're working on these vaccines on the side. But for someone like me who reads that paper, I'm like, no, you just had a huge bio, bio leak in Seattle and, and it should have been followed up by the CDC. They should have run all over Seattle and looked for this and, and all their housemates and everyone else. All right. So there are hundreds of labs around the world doing those same types of experiments where they're taking spike proteins that have been sequenced and there's some differences and they want to characterize those differences, those variants of concern, right? Mm -hmm. You may have heard of this, like there's Omicron, Delta, Alpha. Right, right, right. All of these differences, the, there is a lab somewhere out there cloning that difference, putting it into one of these vectors and putting them into mammalian cells to see, okay, is it worse or is it better? Uh -huh. uh, and that's how they could gauge whether Omicron was like less pathogenic than, than let's say alpha or delta. Okay. So think of hundreds of labs around the world cloning you know, different forms of the spike protein into vectors like this that have the capacity to shuttle between m mammals and E. coli. Uh, that means they're like little zoonotic bombs, if you will, that, that if they get into the lab and they get out, they could spread at their, at their own unknown rate. We don't know what the R naught is of that type of transmission. It's not been followed. It's not been tracked very closely. But there is one case of it in the peer reviewed literature already that it happened in Seattle. So that tells me if there's hundreds of other labs working on this, they, there could be leaks out there that we don't know about. Um, so when I find something like this in a tumor biopsy that isn't identical to Pfizer, my head goes in that direction. Is that, okay, this plasmid that we found it in is called PCDNA3. It is the most commonly used vector for people to study spike protein mutations. Uh, so some lab could have leaked this and gotten to this patient somehow. I, you can't pin it 100% of Pfizer because it's not the fingerprint Pfizer gave to the FDA. 
um, unless Pfizer is playing with multiple plasmids, which they, their paper shows they are. They just haven't disclosed what they are. Mm. Um, so we're stuck with two hypotheses here, that it, it could be something that is uh, contamination in Pfizer's lab that got into this guy's four shots. He gets it. He ends up with tuber cancer a year right. later. Or it could be this person knew somebody at a lab and was in close proximity and got it from them. And uh, and that this ended up replicating in his body, and uh, and ends up with uh, in, in his colon cancer in some way. Uh, so we don't know, but I, I think the the important message I want to get across to people is that the current gain of function debate isn't talking about this. The gain of function debate is people like uh, Barrick making these vi full viruses, but all the research labs that just want to take a tiny piece of the virus out and say, I want to study what this new what this Omicron thing is doing in the laboratory. They've got to be very careful if they put that into a shuttle vector that can infect humans and E. coli. That can't get out um, because the, the Seattle paper showed it can it can it can travel to housemates of the, of the people working in the lab. So they have to make sure that when they do those studies, that they um, they have a kill switch in those plasmids to some extent that doesn't allow it to to, to jump between different organisms. Like only only put in a mammalian something that can replicate in mammalian cells, or only E. coli, but not both. Um, or they've got they've got they've got to just track them a lot more carefully. So, you know, if Rand Paul's listening or anyone who's working on sort of the biosafety now thing, um, they have to look into that Seattle paper and they have to take a look at the data that we found in this colon cancer thing to see is it anywhere else. Like, start using PCR to screen tumor biopsies. These tumor biopsies, people throw them out after two years, um, unless they unless they they paraffin fix them, they can store them longer. But most biopsies are gone in two years. Pathologists That's don't crazy. keep them. So they've got to go and start looking to see, is this an N of one or are there other turbo cancers out there that are spike positive and have plasmids in them that are, that are transmissible? Because if spike is in fact causing turbo cancers, they have a transmissible form of spike um, going through all the research laboratories right now. So that essentially you're saying this SV40 turbo cancer would become contagious. Well, uh, it, it, it would move whether it would manifest in cancer in every patient is something I can't I can't predict, right. but it, it, they may they at least should be able to track it with PCR. You can go and, and, and track the like okay is it leaking anywhere is it jumping from person to person, um, and and are we finding it in more than just n of one biopsies here? Uh, we found it in both biopsy, but it was the same person, two mm -hmm. different time points. But uh, actually we had three time points; they all had it. But um, the sequencing was only done on the first and last. Uh, but we do have to see if if there's a trend here. If they keep finding this plasmid in other biopsies from people with turbo cancer, okay, that's that's that starts to build a build a thesis here, and uh, and then they have to go and review which labs are making these. Did this come from Pfizer or did this come from one of these labs that are studying VOCs? And uh, what does that what does that mean for um, how we think about gain of function research in the future?